And I got on the phone with him and I, I thought, okay, this is an experienced entrepreneur in his mid thirties, maybe in his forties. He started this company when he was 17. Uh, he's now 19 years old. He's attended a few hacker houses, got hooked on this notion of decentralized money and started building. So if you're going to have an army of people around the world that just with an internet connection and a laptop can build companies on the blockchain. I think there's a huge wave of innovation that's about to come. Hey, Bob WP here, and welcome to Emerging Tech, all things WordPress and WooCommerce, a Do The Woo podcast show. This show is brought to you by Hostinger. Whether you're building a WordPress site or specifically a Woo shop, their infrastructure brings your client site speed, uptime and security and omnisend for your email and sms marketing with their crm solution for woocommerce shops or hey your own website i'll tell you more about our sponsors later in the show but let's join dave and his guest stein palman ceo and founder of helio they chat about the potential of crypto and blockchain technology in the world of payments and commerce and Stein also shares his journey as an entrepreneur and his vision for Helio, which aims to simplify crypto payments for businesses. Let's listen in. Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of Emerging Tech on Do The Way with me, Dave Lockie. And this episode I have with me Stein Powen from Helio. Helio is a crypto payment partner of Woo. Um, and Stein's a super interesting guy. So we're going to talk about his journey as a, an entrepreneur. We're going to talk about what's happening in the world of crypto and payments, and we're going to probably speculate about what's to come as well as the crypto market heats up a bit. So welcome and thanks for joining me, Stein. Thank you, Dave. It's a super big pleasure to be here. I don't know if it's a coincidence that Bitcoin is at an all-time high today. But can't, can't be a coincidence. You are it's certainly a, a good day in the crypto space. Um, yeah, it's, it's, been a, it's been a good year. For sure, for sure. So uh, I guess everyone knows and is sick of me. So give me the intro to you. Who are you and uh, how did you get to be on this show with me today? What's, what's the summary journey been? So yeah, I'm Stein. I'm CEO and founder of Helio. I'm a Dutch guy that lives in London with his family. And me and my co-founder, Jim, we've worked together for almost 20 years, believe it or not. So we're kind of seasoned entrepreneurs with a bit of gray hair that have come into the crypto space. But our background is largely building uh, enterprise SaaS companies in the cybersecurity space. Um, we had two previous businesses. As a young guy, I joined a company called ScanSafe, which was the first cloud security uh, provider for web scanning. At the time, it was acquired by Cisco. Nice. And then with that same team, we started a second business, which was delivering cloud VPN solutions to enterprise. And again, that was a 10-year overnight success story, as they say. We built that business <laughs> to 200 people, $35 million in revenue. Uh, and we had a great exit in the summer of 2021. Uh, and we really just wanted to do something completely different, um, kind of building the same or two very similar companies over 20 years uh, was, um, you know, it was great, but you kind of want something new. I was also not the CEO in that previous business. I was kind of the commercial leader of that business, part of the founding team, but really together with Jim wanted to kind of do it uh, sort of our way. And we had a six month period of just brainstorming, hey, what are we going to build next? Is it again in cloud? Is it delivering pizzas with, with drones? Is it something in crypto? And, you know, being in London, Jim and I were meeting up in Regent's Park, going for long walks and really riffing on different ideas. And we felt strongly that. Web3 and crypto is going to be a big wave in sort of the next evolution of the internet uh, and tremendously exciting space. It wasn't clear that we wanted to do payments. We attended conferences. We ended up at a hacker house, Solana hacker house in Prague, uh, speaking to a lot of teams that were building in crypto. 
And what we learned is that, hey, everyone is building their own smart contracts, their own wallet connects uh, to essentially take payments, right? Because that's what blockchain itself facilitates. It's got pretty reals for payments. Um, and in Web2, people just use Stripe or PayPal. So we immediately felt, hey, if we deliver some out-of-the-box tooling, then anybody that wants to build on blockchains can just start accepting payments with Helio. And that's kind of when the idea was born. Did you just use the term 3D payment rails? Or did I, did I hear that in my head? I, I think that's my Dutch accent. Oh, okay. <laughs> that to you. <laughs> but I kind, of, I kind of like that as a visualization, right? Because like with yeah. normal payment rails, it's just about sending financial transactions. But um, crypto rails allow you to send other stuff as well, right? You can send information, you can send transactions, you can send... Uh, anything that can be contained within information. So, you know, pictures of cats or, um, you know, shares in a business yeah. or anything else. So I kind of like that yeah. visualization, even if it was an accident. Yeah, that's a good term. Um, Minted here today. Um, and speaking of uh, inscribing cats, what's your take on ordinals? That's that's kind of a big, uh, a big wave at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, so... Um, Let's just define our terms. So the last cycle, you may have heard of NFTs and projects like uh, CryptoPunks or Board Ape Yacht Club or Pudgy Penguins. Those are um, collectibles on the Ethereum ecosystem. This cycle, there's a lot of narrative around ordinals or inscriptions. I'm personally still not entirely clear about what's what there, but it's basically NFTs on Bitcoin. Uh, and it's the same idea, right? Um, you're in, you're putting data that describes a non fungible asset. And so each ordinal is different or can be different from the other one. One monkey might have green hair, one might have blue. Uh, and when you're buying one, you're buying that specific one with green or blue hair. You're not buying a monkey token. Um, so yeah, I, is that a reasonable definition? Yeah. I think it is very much NFTs on the uh, Bitcoin blockchain. The one big difference that kind of the Bitcoin maxis keep pointing out is that with Ethereum NFTs and with Solana NFTs, you are kind of hosting the metadata on the blockchain and typically the actual uh, image is stored on a server somewhere else and kind of the metadata points to that server. And Bitcoin Maxis will say, hey, what's unique about ordinals is that it's actually inscribed in the Bitcoin blockchain uh, right. with, within, uh, within a block and it can never be changed. Um, so there were NFT projects that did that as well, but you're right. The yeah. majority of them were uh, hosting at least part of the content on either a kind of crypto adjacent or even just a straight up uh, Web2 bit of infrastructure. So yeah, like I think ordinals are going to go nuts the same way that nfts did but for me it's all part of you know and solana has nfts as well i think it's all part of this broader human like intersection of things that people care about so they care about a status and having you know one of a set number of things uh is a status thing especially if it's like ridiculously expensive uh, i think it speaks to kind of in group out group dynamic as well which is really powerful for people as well people want to sort of have a sense of belonging and some of them are you know they're objectively cool bits of art you know some great artists producing stuff and people love aesthetically pleasing things so for me nfts are kind of this real heady mix of a bunch of different mm -hmm. base human desires and i think bitcoin's the biggest crypto ecosystem in terms of value and there are a bunch of people sitting on a bunch of money who've got nothing better to do with it than buy pictures of monkeys. So yeah, I think you know, they're going to do mm. they, they're going to do well. And I wish I'd bought more of them sooner. Is um, yeah, and I think that's what yeah. How about you, you think the same? No, I like relating it back to payments, right? So I think that NFTs in general are a have been an amazing playground for innovating in payments because. You know, what we've seen in the Ethereum space and also Solana to a certain extent, people are building communities around these NFTs and then they're also selling merchandise. They're selling, you know, hats, 
and caps on WooCommerce and they want to do that in Ethereum or Solana or USDC. Uh, that's one thing. But then also, hey, offering discounts, right? Hey, when you hold this collectible, when you're part of the group, uh, sure, you've got this status symbol, you've got a flex, flex on Twitter, but you also get discounts or early access to certain uh, things in the physical world. And so that's really, really interesting. And then maybe things like gating based on, um, on, on, on those NFTs is, is, is very interesting. And then also now with ordinals, what we're seeing is you see a ton more uh, Bitcoin payment volume uh, because a lot of these decentralized wallets, and I think Xverse is a great example, but also Phantom has added Bitcoin support and uh, Magic Eden has done that. And you just see, to your point, a lot more Bitcoins that might have been locked up in, in hidden wallets. They're now being spent because people have been innovating through ordinals to actually unlock a little bit of uh, utility for yep. Bitcoins to be spent. So that's really uh, a great thing to see. Yeah, that's a great point. And there's a general principle, I think, which is that the more liquid a market, the more valuable the assets within that market become. So as people uh, take their Bitcoin out of cold storage or they buy more, then that's going to, like, it's going to increase the liquidity for Bitcoin and that should uh, increase the value of Bitcoin. But there's also the importance of, and we're getting, we're getting a bit down the crypto rabbit hole here, but uh, Bitcoin currently generates revenue. The network generates revenues in two ways at the moment. It generates revenues through fees the miners charge for processing transactions and it also offers rewards for those miners for mining blocks for basically keeping the chain up and running and intact and over time the block rewards are halving you might have heard of the bitcoin halving mm -hmm. that is the rewards are designed into the bitcoin protocol to halve every four years i think it is until essentially there are no rewards left for miners and it's only fees that support um, revenue generation in the Bitcoin network. And that's important because revenue generation, like the fees, are the long-term future of Bitcoin's security model. And if people are just sitting on their coins, not doing much with them, then potentially miners aren't generating many fees and the security of the Bitcoin network suffers. When people are using their coins, then they're doing transactions, they're getting charged fees, and that's contributing back to the, the security of the network. So I think from a, that kind of uh, economic perspective, it's a really good thing for Bitcoin. I'm, I'm like a crypto maxi. I'm not a maxi on any particular coin, and it's really good to see Bitcoin learning from what Ethereum's done and taking some of those ideas and folding them into what they're doing. And I'm sure they'll come up with stuff that's different and that Ethereum can learn that from and Solana can learn from. And, you know, that's, for me, that's a healthy and vibrant ecosystem, not to have one dominant winner, but to have an interplay of different competitors that are always finding different edges and helping us explore that space. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. There's, there's going to be plenty of winners in terms of blockchain. So I believe that too. And the parallel that I sometimes think about is maybe you know, big tech, right? If somebody had asked you in even like the late nineties to say, okay, in 10, 15 years, you're going to have four or five companies that are worth more than 1 trillion, people would have said that's madness. And then, but that's what happened, right? And they were each good at certain, um, right. a certain use case, Facebook. I mean, do, do you just have a Google account? No, right? You've got okay. a Google account, Facebook account, Microsoft, I mean, like you have an account with all the big tech, uh, tech giants. Exactly. So. And that's, um, yeah, we already start to see that certain chains are better than others. Solana is great for payments. Uh, Ethereum is obviously DeFi. DeFi. And, you know, the first one we need to introduce this concept of smart contracts, yeah. Bitcoin store of value. And there's a lot of exciting new chains coming along, right? You've got layer twos, um, you know, base, which is a coin based commerce, uh, layer two. They're doing a ton of interesting things. Yep. Uh, Farcaster, right? The, the social network. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about, about that today. Yep. So let's do that. Uh, cause we've actually put up some bounties for Farcaster. So why don't we, why don't we get off of the Farcaster stop of our conversation train and talk about that for a little bit? So, awesome. uh, Farcaster is a, uh, 
I think the founder describes it as a sufficiently decentralized social network. So um, your account is a crypto wallet and that crypto wallet uh, is your ID, but it can also hold tokens. It can hold Ethereum, it can hold USDC. And there's a couple of tokens that people have created just for use on Farcaster as well. So experience-wise, you can basically imagine it's Twitter, but with a crypto wallet attached. And that was kind of it until earlier this year. Perhaps you guide us through like the emergence of frames and what design space that opens up. Yeah, I think that the frames in Farcast, or actually the social network is called Warpcast, if I'm not mistaken. But Farcast is kind of the underlying. Not mistaken. You're totally right. The underlying protocol. But when you start using it, it does feel exactly like uh, like X. Right, you create an account. You can you can post, you can repost, you can follow, you can like, uh, and then there's this concept of frames, and it's almost the way to think about it is a little storefront inside of your uh, social media posts on broadcast, and then of course users that are reading your your post, they can see that frame and then interact with it, and it's very transactional because. Um, Again, going back to NFTs, a lot of these frames, you are minting NFTs. So you're spending a little bit of crypto to take ownership of that digital image there. And that digital image can maybe represent something physical in the real world that you can redeem. Um, you can imagine, let's say Nike through their cast accounts, um, you know, posting a frame where you could purchase uh, a certain pair of, of, uh, of Jordans. Uh, you mint a pair of Jordans that you can then go and redeem for the real ones in the real world. So that's kind of a flow that people are experimenting with. So minting these these digital collectibles through frames. But then also we've started seeing folks launching uh, mini stores, like almost shop fronts. Um, and at the moment, you know, some of those frames are still linking outside of the Warpcast uh, application. Uh, but ultimately, the idea is that you can purchase directly on the blockchain uh, through these frames. And that's really going to be driving uh, crypto commerce because folks have a wallet attached to their social media accounts. They can purchase uh, essentially digital goods and physical goods on that social media platform using the, the, the money that they have in that wallet. Um, and that seems to be sort of the starting point, but who knows where this is going. But I think this notion of having a frames a, a storefront within your posts, um, where you can, as a creator, monetize on chain. I think that's the, the, the starting point of this, uh, this model. And it's definitely interesting. We're, we're looking at it and uh, we've got this concept of pay links. Um, and we're looking at building out some functionality to make those pay links compatible within Warpcast through frames. It's an exciting opportunity. Yeah, thank you. It's, that's a great intro. If you're used to using X, most of the time you're just seeing, you know, text or images or video or whatever, but sometimes you see something that's a bit different. So if somebody's doing like a broadcast on X, it has like a different look and feel. It's like a little app. Or if somebody runs a poll, then it has its own UX as well. It's like a little standalone app within uh, a, a tweet or a, a sheet or whatever they're called. And Farcaster basically is an extension of that, but it's an open app space. So it sits on Open Graph, which is a standard for metadata that came out of Facebook, like your standard WordPress or WooCommerce site has Open Graph data. A lot of websites do. And that's what graphs, are, uh, sorry, frames are built on. And yeah, I think if you can imagine a little interactive app that is helpful or useful or fun in some way in the context of a social feed, then that's the design space for frames. And I've done everything from playing little games to minting NFTs to, um, voting on things and what's coming i understand next or something that's coming next is like a text field so that you can submit text uh from within a frame and obviously that's 
going to be like a straight up link through to either kind of command line type uh, interfaces for games or applications, or even uh, into LLMs as well. So you'll be able to do sort of giving instructions as well as just clicking buttons. So yeah, I, I'm really excited about this paradigm and WooCommerce Automatic have put up five grants of an ETH each. So one ETH, which today is like three and a half thousand dollars heading towards four, four people to build a cool frame that integrates with WordPress or WooCommerce and, uh, and frames. So you can find me on Warpcast. I'm divvydovvy.eth and the details are there in my feed. And you can reach out to me if you're interested. I think the closing date for the grants is like the end of March. And we've had some really good applications through already. So uh, don't hang about. Do reach out if you're planning to do something so I can give you the best chance of success. But yeah, I think this is where open source and open stuff can win. And I'm really excited to see it happen. That's really awesome. Maybe we should take a look at those grants, Dave, and see if we uh, we submit some of our ideas. Yeah, uh, sure. I've, I've seen a, a few. There's something called warpshop.xyz. So I've seen a few popping up. Uh, I also know that Coinbase Commerce has done some cool stuff. Um, but I think it's huge for crypto commerce. I think the way you describe it, so you're super excited that basically any interaction on the social network is going to be fully decentralized right and recorded on the blockchain it's permissionless so it's great for things like polls and uh, you know voting as you say as well uh, but of course with my payments hats on i always think about kind of um crypto commerce and it's also a great very targeted audience right if you are a merchant that wants to reach people with a crypto wallet um because you, you know, those wallets are funded and there's liquidity to unlock and you, it's an opportunity for you to sell into that audience. Then this is a great kind of a targeted group of, of people that you can go and hang out with and build cool little apps to, um, yeah, to sell to. So yeah, it's a really cool uh, innovation. As a builder or an agency managing multiple sites, check out hostinger.com. Their infrastructure brings your client's site speed, uptime, and security. Also, at your fingertips, you'll find a powerful suite of tools for security and performance, code and content management. Now add to that the ability to manage your WordPress website through WP CLI for control configuration and plugin updates, enhanced WordPress acceleration powered by Lightspeed Enterprise, control over auto updates, free migrations, and of course, the essential staging sites. Through all of their services and features comes e-commerce optimization for your clients' woo shops. So when you think about it, overall, everything you need to keep your client sites running smooth can be found with their agency hosting at hostinger.com. Whether you're a product or a site builder, OmniSend can help you with your customer or client's email and SMS through their CRM solution for WooCommerce. Product builders can bring their plugins and SaaS to a new level for their customers by integrating with OmniSend. And for you developers and agencies recommending them to your clients for managing their customer relationships is spot on because it gives them the right tool to build their email and SMS lists, send targeted campaigns, create automation workflows, and track their results, all from within their WordPress dashboard. With over 100,000 e-commerce stores already on board, have your clients and your customers get started for free by simply having them search for the OmniSend plugin on WordPress.org. Are there any other social networks that you're excited about in uh, in the decentralized world? Yeah, so I've been, I mean, I guess part of my thesis is social plus finance plus uh, everything. It's like a convergent experience, right? And like the feed, the sort of swipeable feed is the default experience that people just have been trained to. It seems to be like optimum at least for a smartphone age. Um, 
And when you add in like that information with the social graph, you end up with social networks. I can post this, it can go out, people can riff on it. That's been really interesting. When you add financial rails into that, I think you open up even more creative space. So we've seen people create currencies just for use within uh, Farcaster. And I will answer your question, but I just wanted to loop back on this one. Mm -hmm. And I think what one of the things that we could see this, this crypto cycle is somebody waking up, having a great creative idea and going to bed a millionaire because there are no throstles on distribution or payments. You don't have to onboard anywhere. You just push something up. It's mm -hmm. got a mint price, goes viral, and you go to bed with a thousand ETH in your wallet or whatever. I can totally see that happening. But uh, something that I'm particularly passionate about and why I, was, why I remain extremely excited about my role here is that when you look at commerce, if, when you look at payments activity, there's a vast amount of payments for uh, goods that run their $5. It's coffee or it's like little bits and pieces, but we don't really do that in terms of digital experiences. So, you know, we'll buy an ebook, but we don't buy a blog post. We'll buy a, an audiobook, but not a, Mm. Uh, podcast, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there are a couple of things. I think the first is it's actually just not very cost effective to use traditional payment rails to do small payments because, you know, the credit card companies or the PayPal's will t charge you, you know, a, a decent fee. I think it's like 40 cents for PayPal if it's under $5 or something. It's like quite a high fee compared to the overall money you're making. Models. And then it's also the friction, like, oh, I've got to sign into PayPal and one time password and send the funds and blah, blah, blah. It's just like a high, it's relatively high friction, relatively high cost for what seems like very little return. I think when you introduce the mechanic of collecting, of like, oh, I've actually got something for this. Like, it's not just that I like this tweet, it's that I can, I can put it in my library of things that I like, I can look at them all later, or maybe it'll be worth something, maybe I can sell it. But when you have a funded crypto wallet that is already connected, A, it's super cheap to do even very small payments, so it's cost effective, and B, it can be totally seamless with the user interface. So on uh, Farcaster, you can just hit a button and you send people warps or DGEN, or you can just type a slash command, as you can send people Mm. funds as easy as you can do anything else you know like retweet you know send funds so i really hope that it's going to open up this more lucrative and exciting space for the creator economy where people can just say look i've got a great idea back me i'm going to do this and people will do it and we've seen lots of examples of that happening already and my hope is that this little niche this little corner of the digital ecosystem is going to see some real success stories and people are in the web two space are going to go, hang on, what? And these guys can't be deplatformed and Farcaster are, are taking 80% of their revenue. Like, this is great. Like, let's go over there, guys. Because they'll be able to reinvest uh, their energy into things which are more directly benefiting them and their audience. So, yeah, I think these social platforms, to answer your question, hey, is another one, hey, XYZ, and I think they've just had a, a new native token bonsai airdrop to active users. So I think we're going to see a bunch of this stuff, um, whether it's social networks adding crypto features or it's crypto wallets adding social features. And there's just a big convergence coming and it's going to be and it, just a very heady design space, basically. That was a really long answer, Stein, sorry. No, it's all good. I mean, I, I think... What you touched on as well is this airdropping, right? To incentivize folks to come to your social network. I think a lot of crypto uh, rides on speculative use cases. So users wanting to make a quick buck. And what we've seen already is with a bunch of play to earn type models, it's not really sustainable. So what I really like about Farcaster is that they're not doing that, right? They're not saying, hey, come and join your network and you get a ton of tokens, and once you've got them, people disappear again. So, um, yeah, I really like their approach. And what you mentioned about 
you know, micropayments and essentially identity because your crypto wallet is also your identity. You know, you, you don't need to say that you are uh, Dave on the social network, right? You can stay anonymous and people can really express themselves in different ways anonymously. Sure. Um, and you can still accept payments, right, to your public key. If you deliver a cool software program or great content, people can just send you one USDC uh, or warps or whatever token it might be through the network to your wallet address. Uh, that's a really cool way of, of monetizing. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. People express themselves differently if you don't need to say who you are. And it's just lowering the barriers to transactions. I don't need to sign up with an yeah. email address and a password and my home address in order to transact and exchange value with, with the creator. So, um, yeah, it's very exciting. And you can see this also playing out like the other side of this, or like one of one of the other tributaries, I guess, to this convergence is meme coins. Like this uh, crypto cycle already seems to be meme coin season. Bonk was one of the early instigators on Solana, taking the mickey out of Ethereum. We've had dog with hat. We've got cat with hat. We've got last cycles Doge. We've got all these like stupid meme coins uh, jumping off and making people like you know millionaires overnight. But I think it, if you kind of squint and look at them, it's like, well, you know, you get memes go viral on social media and meme coins are going viral on crypto networks. Well, like, you know, when those are the same thing, when the, the memeing and the social and the financial are all knit together, like it's just pouring more petrol on that, isn't it? It is. Why do you think people are buying these meme coins? Is it just, is it? The unlimited upside is that the, the kind of play here. So, you know, being a, putting $200 in and emerging as a millionaire. I think, I mean, I think that drives a lot of the behavior is like you know, greed and hope. But I also think there's like this interesting kind of almost generational dynamic at play, which is that I think a lot of, people get into crypto because they're sick of the like the construct that you're born into with traditional capital and markets and mm. money uh and when the money is working like when the economy when money is working for people then nobody cares right everyone can have a nice life buy a new car buy a tv blah 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 but the story over the last 30 years or so has actually been of decreased spending power as currencies have become devalued to the point where even people who like both parents are working they've got good jobs they're still struggling to like make ends meet and now there's an alternative which is like not bound up with all these prior power structures and people can create new economies and new money and they you know i think a bunch of people have basically said your money stinks like we're not going to use it anymore we're going to use our money and that was bitcoin Really, that was the genesis of that is like the chancellor bails out the banks for the second time. This is corrupt. Let's do something better. Let's do something different. But, you know, there's a bunch of people that were late to Bitcoin and now Bitcoin's like 70K or whatever. Like not many Gen Zers can buy a Bitcoin. So, you know, the same thing happens. We just create our own money. And because we're young and don't, you know, DGAF, we're going to create a coin that's got a picture of a dog with a hat on it and like, screw you. It's kind of, cyclical thing to this and like where that goes i don't know because when anyone can spin up a currency it, it, and if enough people believe in it then it has value like how quickly can that happen and what happens when you've got like fifty thousand of these currencies how do you kind of have any sort of store of value i don't know but anyway another long answer for you stein i think you're right with this sort of fuck you mentality that people are like it's a bit of hope and greed, but a lot of it is also driven by folks in countries where, uh, you know, the system isn't working for them. And the dollar, the dollar is not working for them, let alone their own native currency. They want, exactly. They want a different, a different play. Um, and yeah, it's probably a generational thing as, as well, right? So um, I was speaking to another founder in the Solana ecosystem. They build a really cool app 
called Candy Pay, also a great payments app. And I got on the phone with him and I, I thought, okay, this is an experienced entrepreneur in his mid thirties, maybe in his forties. He started this company when he was 17. Uh, he's now 19 years old and Amazing. he's in Calcutta. He is, he's attended a few hacker houses, got hooked on this notion of decentralized money and started building. So, you know, if you're going to have an army of people around the world that just with an internet connection and a laptop can build companies on the blockchain, I think that's a, there's a huge wave of innovation that's about to come. Yeah. And I think what's missing for a lot of these young entrepreneurs is maybe a little bit of, you know, okay, how do you run a business? How do I raise a bit of money to get this idea a bit further? How do I deal with customers? Um, so yeah, we also, in our space, we try and help sort of slightly younger entrepreneurs, um, streamline some of their ideas into proper businesses rather than just kind of chase the DJ money online. Yeah. One of the ways I've heard the evolution of the web described is that you had Web 1 protocols, which were essentially like the open standards, TCP, IP, and HTTP, and SMTP. <clears throat> All of those things where the web was essentially permissionless, like you could hit an endpoint, you could do stuff with it, you could send an email. We then grew into corporate networks, which is essentially, you know, the Googles, Facebooks, et cetera. And suddenly you need an API key and KYC for everything. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the corporate network world, which was, you know, becoming irretrievably dominant until blockchain crypto networks, like permissionless decentralized networks emerged as an alternative to them. Just as web one protocols didn't go away when corporate networks emerged. Neither will corporate networks go away, but I do think that the crypto stuff allows for that permissionless innovation that made, like allowed Web 1 to give birth to Web 2, you know, for that value creation and those entrepreneurs to realize their dreams. You know, the Silicon Valley story really is all born off the bedrock of those Web 1 protocols. And I think you're exactly right. The crypto protocols are going to let a new generation unlock value built off the back of these permissionless decentralized protocols too. So yeah, I mean, I'm here for it, Stein. I'm here for it. Yeah. Let's try and take our heads out of the sky and uh, bring them back down to earth a little bit. So Helio has an extension for WooCommerce. You're a partner. You, you can find the Helio extension on Woo.com. Um, and I think it really showcases the product and startup and kind of, I guess, the application heritage that you and Jim bought to the business. You know, it's a very merchant-friendly, very considered experience. And part of that lives within the extension and part of it lives on your own hosted dashboard. What are, like, um, whether it's WooCommerce or, because you, you also offer uh, extensions on Shopify or just like commerce generally, if you're a Woo developer, and you're thinking like, okay, but how can my clients make use of this? Or if you're a Woo merchant, you're thinking, okay, but like, how can I actually use this stuff? How can I make some of this dog money? What are you seeing merchants do? How are they implementing crypto and Helio to help you know their business succeed? Yeah. So crypto payments, they enable a whole bunch of different things. At the core, as we've discussed, it's a peer-to-peer payment. So that's why it's very different to a card payment, right? There's no intermediary. Even when you use Helio as a method of payment, as a merchant, we don't ever touch your money. So we never take custody of funds. It's just that the plugin that we have for Woo has a simple widget inside it where the, where the uh, buyer can connect their crypto wallet and then select the currency that they want to spend and then hit the pay button. And then the merchant instantly receives that money. It also means that we don't need to uh, share a lot of fees with banks or other payment processors. So I think instant money in your bank account or in your crypto wallet in this case, uh, plus very low fees, um, in our case, 1%, are two great advantages of crypto payments and using Helio and other examples in uh, in within Wool. 
But it's not the reason, the number one reason why merchants decide to sell with crypto. I think where we're seeing that merchants get really excited is if they can drive more sales and actually reach an audience of crypto fluent people that have money in their wallet. So there's dog money that you talk about and they're willing to spend it. So if you consider that there are 100 million crypto wallets around the world, more or less, and together they now hold $3 trillion almost, that money needs to flow somewhere because people are not just going to sit on their Bitcoin forever or their Ethereum forever. They want to spend it. So I think it's a huge opportunity for merchants in general to tap into that audience. Where we see success with Wu merchants is people that have a little bit of a crypto flavor. So they tend to be you know, maybe merchants run by an entrepreneur who likes crypto themselves. They have a little bit of experience with it, um, for instance. Or uh, we have a merchant called Hive Mapper, uh, which is selling, um, you know, decentralized hardware. So they sell webcams that people can then uh, put in their their cars, drive around, and help Hive Mapper map out the world as a competitor to Google. And they actually get rewarded with tokens for that. Um, so these are the type of merchants that have a little bit of crypto exposure already. And I think in the short term, that's where we see a lot of installations. So crypto fluent merchants that get it and they want to unlock more sales. I think in the medium term, you know, we're also going to see a lot more money proliferate, right? As decentralized wealth grows and more users have wallets then I think people will start demanding from their merchants, hey, why are you not also offering crypto payment options? And from that point of view, I think it's going to follow kind of this similar trajectory as other payments innovations. Buy now, pay later. I think that's a great payment innovation of the Apple last pay, year. Google Pay, yeah. all of those things, yeah. That's a great, those are all great payment innovations. And it takes probably five years before you get to uh, early maturity, right? Maybe 10% of people are, are, are using those payment options and then it will really explode. Yeah, we're really focused on enabling kind of these merchants that understand crypto and they want to sell more, reach those users with wallets. And then I think it will start proliferating quite rapidly. Uh, and we might even see that in this kind of Bitcoin cycle, right? You spoke earlier about the every four years as a new Bitcoin cycle because the hash rate halves, um, that's happening in April. Um, so maybe between now and 2028, you're going to see hopefully upwards of 10% of merchants on Woo with the kind of uh, crypto payment options uh, enabled in their store. So that's what we expect to happen. So one thing that I think is important for merchants to realize is that there's, I think there's broadly speaking, two flavors of crypto. One is a Bitcoin or an Ethereum, where a Bitcoin is worth a variable amount of US dollars or euros or pounds. One day it could be worth 65, one day it could be worth 60. You know, you, it's, a, it's a market and you can expect there to be volatility compared to like your standard issue dollar, pound or euro. But there's also a category or a class of cryptocurrencies called stable coins. I've heard them described as... Yeah. Crypto, crypto dollars as well, like the kind of petrodollar or euro dollar. Maybe you could just give us a, and explain it like I'm five about stable coins and why those might be a kind of attractive entry point to more traditional merchants. I also like the term digital dollar, which is our stable coin. So it's the important thing is that it's fixed to typically a fiat currency, uh, of course, the US dollar being the most uh, widely used one around the world. So USDC, USDT uh, are the two biggest stable coins. Um, and they're actually backed by US dollar reserves. So the issuers of these stable coins, these digital dollars, actually stack real dollars in order to back up the price. So it's very much linked to... Um, yeah, to the actual dollar. And it means that we take out any volatility from merchants, right? Because rather than if I'm selling a cap for $50 um, and 
you know, I take payment in Solana, let's say half a Solana for that cap. The next day, maybe that half a Solana might only be worth $40. So I think if I can just accept $50 in digital dollar equivalents, uh, then I know that I don't have any currency risk. Uh, and it's very easy for me to redeem those digital dollars for actual dollars. Um, you know, typically you can off ramp them through a, an exchange like Coinbase. Or if you're a business, you can also do that directly with the issuer of uh, the digital dollars. So Circle is the issuer of USDC. So you can create an account, hook up your bank account, and then let's say if you receive your 50 USDC through WooCommerce, you can then go ahead and redeem that for real dollars. Um, so it's a great innovation to just remove any volatility out of digital currency payments. And if you look at our platform, most folks expect that the majority of our payment volume is in stable coins, but it's actually not. It's about one third is in stable coins and about two thirds in typically the native currencies of the blockchains like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana. Um, and some merchants that believe in the upward kind of uh, price movement of digital currencies also prefer to accept payments in those currencies because they want to maybe keep it as a treasury strategy. And it depends a little bit what you're selling, right? But if you make a healthy profit margin on anything you sell through your Woo store, you could also say, hey, actually, I'm going to stack 10% of my digital currency income. I want to keep that in Bitcoin because I want to grow my treasury. Um, but of course, if you're a business that operates on very thin margins, then I think stable coins are the way to go to, to really hedge against any risk. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great introduction. And, um, I guess the, like one other, well, I guess a couple of key advantages of stable coins, like very fast transfer as well, payments directly into the wallet. You as a merchant get, get paid redeemable U S dollars, uh, very quickly. There's no delay for deposits. Also possible for anyone to acquire. So, um, dollars, you know, you're kind of stuck with your currency and depending on the country you live in, capital controls can be looser or tighter. So, you know, if you're in Argentina, the government's not keen on you getting hands on dollars, but actually dollars are a good way for Argentinians to keep their wealth because it's devaluing less than their currency. And it means that they can transact internationally as well. So where you have big trading blocks like um, South America that aren't on a single currency, it can be really useful. You know, if you're in Argentina, you want to buy something from Brazil, you can transact in USDC and that kind of international remittance and universal availability of stable coins. I think as we have increasingly global supply chains, whether that's B2B, B2C, to me, it just makes sense. Like, why would you not want something that is universally available, cheap to send, and pegged to your real world costs? Yeah. Just stack. Plus, just... plus speed, right? Like, the instant settlement part is just so important of this. Um, yeah. And um, yeah. No, no, no chargebacks. No, no chargebacks or no refunds except the ones that you control. So, obviously, you have to comply with your local laws, consumer laws, business laws, whatever but it keeps you in control of how you want to run the business. There's no uh, fear that the card company or the bank is going to reach into your account and take out funds, you know, without your say so. So for some businesses, particularly in kind of high risk sectors, that's probably an advantage for other companies. Maybe it's just added admin and overhead and aggro and they're happy to use the payment card rails, but this is all about introducing choice and optionality um, for merchants and their customers for me. I uh, really appreciate you exploring it with me today, Stan. It's, it's always, it's always a fun chat, buddy. Yeah, same, same here. So um, the, uh, the future of, of commerce is, is going to be rooted in, uh, in digital innovations like crypto, no doubt. And it's great to see you guys are leading the way. Um, so uh, I think cri the crypto ethos just fits super well with the decentralized approach to commerce that, that uh, you know, that Wu is spearheading. And it's a very different model, right, to Shopify. Um, and yeah, so I think a lot of the crypto-friendly merchants will be, will be using Wu versus a Shopify, where it's a lot more walled gardens um, and kind of less choice for, for merchants and buyers. So. Yeah, it's a pleasure we, to we, be supporting you guys. 
we we just want to make sure everyone has got the freedom to sell, the freedom to transact, and Shopify is a great solution. You know, they play on the road a lot of the times, but we're open source. We have different values, different mission, um, and yeah. To be honest, as long as people are making a living online uh, and selling successfully and creating value for the, themselves and those around them, become happy wherever they're doing that. What? And hopefully they'll do that with Woo. One hundred percent. That's all. Well, uh, thanks for your time, Stone. I'm sure we'll chat soon, and hopefully there'll be a craft beer involved. Let's make that happen. Let's hope it's in the south of Europe, not in rainy London. Next time. Hey, man. Amen. All right. Amen. All right. Be well. I'd like to thank Stein for joining Dave to get a deeper dive into crypto payments as they continue to be a part of the overall e commerce space. And please check out both hostinger.com and omnisend.com and the support they bring to do the woo. Until the next time. <laughs>